Hello and welcome to another edition of Door County Today. I'm your host, Paul Renier of Door County Nature and Travel. I'm here at one of the most pristine properties in Door County, the Clearing Folk School in Ellison Bay. We'll learn about its founder, renowned landscape architect Jens Jensen, who started it back in 1935. The clearing is a beautiful example of Jensen's lifelong dedication to the prairie style of landscape architecture. We'll also discover how the famous Door County fish boil began almost 50 years ago at two northern Door County restaurants. Later, we'll visit the Washington Island Music Festival, an annual event that features a week of performances by classical musicians from around the country. Finally, we'll talk with Dave Ellman about his summer-long folk music festival in the Camp David Party Barn, the Fish Stock Music Series. Now, let's start this month's show with a look at Jens Jensen's life and work. The best description I've heard of him, the one I like the best, is that he was a nature mystic. More practically, he was a landscape architect, a very influential landscape architect. He was an important mover and shaker in the early land conservation movement, something he gets very little credit for. And most importantly to me, uh, he's the founder of The Clearing. I vaguely became aware of Jensen when I can still remember seeing a black Ford coupe uh, parking uh, in the house next to the one I grew up in, which is where Emma Tuft's brother lived. Jensen was born in Debal, Denmark, into a somewhat prosperous farm family. He met a young woman named Anna Marie Hansen. They became engaged. She was his fiance. They both decided they would uh, emigrate to America and came uh, in 1864. Well, he had an interesting history in Chicago. When he first got to the U.S., he settled in Florida, didn't like that, went to Iowa, didn't like there, wound up in Chicago and started working for the parks. There he uh, rose from the rank of a park sweeper, the street sweeper, uh, to become head of the West Chicago Park System. And in 1888, he designed and planted what he called an American garden. It was a garden that consisted primarily of uh, indigenous native plants and designed in more of a free-form style, unlike the typical geometric star shapes, circles, etc. Eventually, Jensen was made superintendent of Union Park. That was by 1890. He was uh, later dismissed in 1900. There was a bit of corruption at the time. Jensen refused to go along with some of the deals that people he worked with and worked for uh, cooked up. But when political administrations changed, he returned to the West Park as a general superintendent and landscape architect. In fact, in 1918, he completed Columbus Park, which he considered to be his premier achievement. It was one of the few parks that he worked on that started from scratch, that is to say, from a completely natural landscape. Jensen, that's Jensen's park. He designed that park. I played in it as a kid. I had no knowledge, who, you know, who the hell thinks about why do we have this park, you know. But it was, uh, uh, in a sense, he was working his magic on me as a, as a child. After Jensen was dismissed from the West Park system again, he started his own practice, started taking on clients. He began to establish a name as a prominent uh, professional landscape architect. He eventually moved his studio from downtown to uh, a place in Ravinia that he purchased. And uh, he started designing estates, uh, Henry Ford, Armour, Florsheim, a lot of big names. Yeah, he did Etzel Ford's, Henry's son, uh, his estate in Maine. Uh, if you look at the list of, of estates that he planned over his career as an estate planner, it's a long and impressive list. Jensen undertook another project that he was very proud of, Lincoln Memorial Gardens in Springfield, Illinois. He was very fond of Abraham Lincoln and uh, did that project without even charging uh, the people who were developing it. A few years later, along came a woman who was seeking a job, knocking on his door. Her name was Mirtha Fulkerson. And there was something about her that impressed Jensen, and he hired her right away. 
and she became his lifetime helper and assistant and uh, protege. When Jensen was in Denmark, he attended uh, folk schools. That was a system of education uh, developed by the Danes to hold on to their cultural heritage. At the time, Denmark was um, occupied by Germany, and the Danish people were afraid of losing their language and their culture. In these folk schools, people, uh, the young people would go on a lot of field trips, they would plant things, they would sit around uh, the campfire at night talking about uh, Danish uh, history. And you learn for not, not for the grades, but for, for the learning. And that was Jensen's philosophy. And really, from early on, had a dream of, of establishing a folk school for adults somewhere in the upper Midwest where, where people in the urban areas could get away and reconnect with nature. By 1919, was in a position to do something about it, sent uh, some young men out from his design studio to find this perfect place to build uh, this school. It had to be on the edge of the wild, high up on a hill or a bluff, looking out over a large expanse of water. And third, it should face the setting sun because there lies the promise of tomorrow. And he, he arranged to come up uh, in the spring of 1919 to look around, found this property, fell in love with it instantly, and, and purchased the first 75 acres of what was to become the clearing. For 16 years, the Jensen family used it as a summer vacation place. He had four grown children by then with their own children, and each child got the place for a month. He and his wife, Anne Marie, could have, of course, come anytime they wanted to, so it was a vacation property. I get the impression that he would have started the school earlier than 1935, but his wife, Anne Marie, who no doubt liked coming up here for vacations, couldn't see living here year round. She died in 1934, and he started the school the next year. He was an extremely influential landscape architect, and I know when he died in 1951, the New York Times ran his obituary, called him the most important American landscape architect, which is high praise. People keep asking all the time, what, when did the fish boils start? The meal itself goes back to probably the turn of the uh, 19th century to the 20th century. Loggers were here and uh, sailors brought them in and they had cauldrons and they certainly had plenty of fish. Commercial fishermen uh, would use it as a way to feed the crews. You could boil the fish right on the boat itself on a pot-bellied stove. Very simple and, and meal with, of course, the available food. Somewhere along the line, somebody started the fish boil. Commercially, the uh, Viking Grill in Ellison Bay was the first one. Lawrence and Ed Wickman started it in about 1960 when tourism really turned around in this country. Well, they were having fish boils uh, for money makers for the community. But then it would say, come into the restaurant and they say, when's the next fish boil? Well, next year. It'll be next year. Well, we don't want to wait that long. Why can't you have it here? That was the early 60s. So Lawrence and Annette started the fish boil, and they're the only ones doing it commercially, and they'd serve up to 700, 800 people in one night. And I remember one time when we had a fish boil, but we had 700, 900 people, but then we had buses. And that's, what, that's how the business grew. My dad had a bar over in Bailey's Harbor, and uh, he did a trout boil, and that would be back in the 46, 47. My brother and I were about nine, 10 years old. I recall coming up into the area as, as a kid, and I didn't see fish boil signs. I saw <laughs> trout boil signs. And when the lamprey killed off the trout, then they went to the next thing available, and that was whitefish. The basic meal is the same. They all feature Lake Michigan whitefish, usually fresh. Uh, right now, this time of the year, we get it delivered fresh the day of the boil probably was caught this morning. And we start out with our cauldron, and our cauldron is about oh, 20 gallons of water. And the first thing we put in is about three pounds of salt. The salt uh, is in there just a little bit for flavoring, but its real purpose is to bring all the fats and oils up to the top of the water. 
and there's a large amount of salt used. People think it's going to be salty. It isn't. We bring that uh, water to a boil, and when it's boiling, we start with our small new red potatoes. About 20 minutes into the time for the potatoes, I put another net on top of that, and it has all the fish in it. And the fish will be in for eight to 10 minutes. Then we'll put the onions in. The onions are small, sweet Spanish onions, and we'll cook them two, three minutes. When I first add the potatoes and when I first add the fish, I do put just another pinch of salt in. Um, pinch of salt is really a misnomer. In the first boil, it's pounds, not pinches. You can see the oils that are forming now. It's just a little bit on the top. This is a first boil. And the very first boil, you don't have as much oils that you do the second and the third one. Although, when we do boil it over, we lose about five gallons of water. So, 20 gallons, so about a quarter of the water is replaced each, uh, each uh, boil. Now you can see the fish here is, is getting done. Just by looking in here at it, it's starting to float a little bit, and that'll happen about four minutes. Yeah, three, four minutes just before it's about time to take off. Now here's our fuel oil, which we use to boil over with. Not a big deal, you know, but it's, it's there. I'm not. <laughs> See how long it lasted? I know a lot of people think that the fish boil is uh, the overboil yeah, is for the show. It certainly is a spectacular oil. event, but it does have that purpose. It, you don't, if, if you didn't and you pulled the uh, nets out without doing the boil off, you really would want to rinse it or somehow, and of course with a big outdoor net, that wouldn't be a very easy process. We open the first Friday in April, and I boil every Friday from April to the end of December. In winter, we, we get them out for a few minutes to watch the, the climax of the boil, but the rest of the time, they're comfortably sitting in their tables inside. Door County is such a unique place, and they're up here and they're having fun. The weather's nice, they're on vacation. You know, people stopped earlier, what time is your boil over? Well, you know, if it boils in time, it'll be at 4.30. If it doesn't, well, it won't. They're not everybody did it like we did. We did it for sort of like, a, more like a show, making it wonderful to come to it. Makes my mouth water, it really does. <laughs>
preferably on the waterfront, so they get the benefit of being on an island, and they give us this fabulous music. So we have a good number of very high quality musicians. Most of them come from the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra. We have several from the Wisconsin Conservatory of Music. We have a gal who comes up, Samantha George. Now she used to be the assistant concert master with the uh, Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra. And she plays with the ensemble. But uh, what she also does is she gives pre-concert talks and will spend 15, 20 minutes talking about the pieces that are going to be played. And the people have said that these talks really make a difference. When I sit down in November to start the process, it, it usually takes me about six to eight weeks to organize it. And, and really the hard part is, is not finding what to play, but finding what to eliminate because there's so much wonderful music. That's really the task, is to choose the major works that are going to appeal to the musicians and to the audience. And from that, you try to find something familiar to them, or at least by a familiar composer or style, and something they've never heard before. We want it. We want people to come up here. We want them to see what we have, and of course, spread the word. They have a, a, a program they're putting on that is unique to the island. It features a, a local poet uh, who has passed away, and, and they are using his poetry. We suggested to Eric Wazen that he might want to consider uh, some of Bill Olson's poetry uh, as the text for these choral pieces. And he came up with uh, island songs and landscapes. And Bill Olson's poetry captured the spirit. And it's a work about basically Washington Island through the seasons. So I enjoyed having that opportunity to write this piece. Uh, hearing my music brought to life like that is it's thrilling. It's thrilling because composers, a lot of times, it's a solitary profession. You hear it in your ears. You hear the performers play it like that. It's great. What we love so much is that this is such a, a special place and um, to have the privilege of bringing our family here and to be able to um, work in depth on music and to create art here is something that, um, that we just really can't put any kind of value on other than to just say thank you so much to those who make it possible. People just have to be so in love with music, so in love with uh, playing chamber music together that they want to reserve this time in their, in their summer schedules to come here for two weeks and just, just be devoted to chamber music. The festival has not grown so much in, in size and scope, but rather in quality. And that's really the kind of growth that I think we're all most interested in. Well, fish stock is a result primarily because of my father. He was a really fine musician, and everyone in my family, all seven children, learned to play an instrument, and all of our family reunions were musical reunions. And I thought if I could convert the barn into a performing arts center, that I would feature music. And we started having concerts 17 years ago. We thought it was an interesting combination of an old guy like me that's from the Woodstock era, and the fact that we lived in Fish Creek, and so Stuart Dawson, who painted the sign behind me here, suggested that we call it fish stock. So it's been known as fish stock ever since. When I first came around Door County, I met Dave Elman, certainly among the first people that I was introduced to. He's got quite a social calendar. And I think he still does this, but I think like every other weekend he had, would have like a picnic. And so there were people that would informally come to these and that included a bunch of musicians. And then, in the fall, maybe it was the first Sunday after Labor Day, something like that, he would have an informal concert in the barn that was called the Folk Concert or the Folk Show. And this was um, uh, before he got, you know, 
a certificate of occupancy or whatever it is so that he could charge admissions. The American Folklore Theater were my first real sources of entertainment. And because Fred Alley, his brother David, his whole family is like my family, uh, they were in existence longer than I was in existence here. Fred was always kind of supportive of all these kind of events. And so Fred, I think, uh, agreed to be the MC. You know, different people would get up and do a few things, and there were tables that were just like spools, you know, many of which are probably still out in the back at Camp David. And then somewhere a few years after that, Dave got it together to make it legit and got it porta potty and whatever permits he needed to actually have uh, events and to charge money. And I'm pretty sure I was the first one. That fall, I did my very first Fish Dock concert series, and I was really afraid that no one would show up. After that first Fish Dock show, uh, another local musician, Nick Hoover, had recorded the, the concert on his four-track cassette recorder. He had plugged it into the board, and he gave me a copy of it. And I played it for Fred, and we were both just blown away. I mean, it was really raw sounding but just the essence of the performance was great and the energy was there. And so Fred and I got really inspired by it and we decided to go ahead and release it. I think that Fred wrote liner notes for eventually he got the cassette and helped Eric to master it and release it as Eric Lewis Live in Fish Creek. I think that that CD really helped because you know, once you have a CD of it, now people who aren't around Door County can know about it and say, hey, this sounded like fun. And, um, so I, I think that was the first year and then it, it kind of grew. it just seems to get bigger and bigger and it it affords me an opportunity to bring more talent and hopefully even people more talented than what I can offer to introduce to Door County audiences. All the people that Eric has brought up like Tommy Burroughs, uh, Chris Irwin also, you know that, that they come for one gig but end up sticking around a few weeks and you know Tommy Burroughs seems to be there most of the summer now and you know, because, uh, and cross-pollinating, you know, different combinations of people playing. It's definitely, it's, it's unique and it, again, it's, it's hard to describe to somebody who's not there. You, know, you just kind of have to go there and, and see. Um, I just, I couldn't say enough good things about the music scene here. It's just growing and getting better and, you know, it's just a, wonderful place to come and play and, and in, at the Fish Stock Concert Series, you know, and it's an annual event. It just keeps growing and getting bigger and better every year. Thanks for joining us today. Remember to come back often to learn more about Door County's history, landscapes, businesses, and people. I'm Paul Renier, 
for Door County Today. See you next time.